Well, hello. Um, my, uh, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons second annual World Commons Week event. Mm -hmm. This is the regional keynote webinar for North America where Professor Scott Shackelford of Indiana University will be discussing his forthcoming book on uh, our global internet commons entitled Governing New Frontiers in the Information Age Toward Cyber Peace. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons mm -hmm. Executive Council and an organizer of the World Commons Week event. Mm -hmm. As uh, attendees may understand, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice and has two primary components. Uh, coordinated local events around the world, Mm -hmm. And this year, a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. The latter is one of IASC's efforts to promote global dialogue on commons research and practice by taking advantage of internet-based web technology, allowing our community to gather virtually while reducing our, carbon, our community's carbon footprint and its impact on the global atmospheric commons. Mm -hmm. So before we get started, let me explain how this webinar will work. Uh, we've asked our distinguished speaker to talk uh, no more than 40, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll act as the timer, and I'll provide a reminder via the chat function to the speaker when they have 10 minutes or 15 or five minutes left. The last 15 minutes of the session, 10 or 15 minutes will be left for question and answer. Mm -hmm. If any of the attendees uh, have a clarification question of the talk, um, use either the Q&A function or the chat, and I'll break in and ask the question for you. Um, so attendees, to, to ensure the webinar functions well, we're limiting video and audio um, and just uh, allowing um, Scott to uh, um, present. In fact, Scott, I'm going to start the video. If you, if you want to put your video on, um, mm -hmm. go for it. Yeah. Um, so at the bottom, attendees at the bottom, if you've never knew, used Zoom before, um, you can move your mouse on the screen and you should see a menu, a black menu. And in that menu, there's a Q&A. If you click on that, that's a question and answer box where you can type in questions. Mm -hmm. There's also a chat function. And you should also be able to see a button that allows you to raise your hand. Um, for attendees, it uh, doesn't look like, I don't think anybody's on this, but in case I'm wrong, for any attendees who have called in by phone, you can let me know you've got a question by dialing star nine to toggle your, to raise and lower your hand function. And I'll, I'll see it and unmute you. So with that introduction, let me turn um, to Professor Scott Shackelford, who serves on the faculty at Indiana University where he's the cybersecurity program chair, along with being the director of the Ostrom Workshop Program on Cybersecurity and Internet Governance. Mm -hmm. He's also an affiliated scholar at both the Harvard Kennedy School, Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and at Stanford Center for Internet and Society, mm -hmm. as well as a senior fellow at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and a term member at the Council of Foreign Relations. Scott, you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Scott has written more than 100 articles, books, chapters, essays, and op-eds, and he's also the author, in addition to this book that he'll be talking about mm -hmm. coming out soon, mm -hmm. he's also the author of a book, Managing Cyber Attacks uh, in International Law, Business, and Relations in Search of Cyber Peace that came out with Cambridge University Press in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, without further ado, uh, Scott, thank you so much for preparing the talk, and Go for it. No, oh, no, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, um, Charlie. And, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone, everybody. Thanks so much for, for beaming into this. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, as Charlie said, I'll, I'll make sure that I don't go more than 40, 45 minutes here. So we should have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. I thought I would structure things by first talking a little bit about uh, actually the Ostrom workshop, since I assume that, you know, most people either on the call or viewing later at least are somewhat familiar with it. Um, as Charlie mentioned, I am the program director for our program on cybersecurity and internet governance. Uh, but right now I'm also the acting director of the whole Ostrom Workshop. Um, and for those who might not be as familiar, uh, you know, the Ostrom Workshop was originally named the Workshop on Political Theory and Policy Analysis. 
um, after Lynn uh, won the Nobel Prize 10 years ago, almost exactly to the day, uh, and was renamed the Ostrom Workshop in her and her husband Vincent's um, honor. And you know, they've done so much work over, over decades, uh, really right until, believe it or not, the evening before Lynn's passing, uh, to push the frontiers of governance research in really, really meaningful and profound ways, challenging conventional wisdom. Uh, for example, around the tragedy of the commons, only being able to nationalize or privatize your way out of it, or that bigger is always better when it comes to municipal governance. Um, Professor Barbara Allen, for example, has a wonderful documentary on the Ostroms that we're going to be uh, airing at, at the same time that we'll be commemorating Lynn's statue this coming spring. So if you're interested, there's already some clips available online, but I'd really encourage all of you to check that out because she had an absolutely remarkable life um, together with Vincent. Um, so, you know, these days what's going on around the Ostrom workshop. So we have four independent programs uh, that have been stood up. Uh, under this broad rubric of governance, right? Um, so as many of you know, I'm sure, you know, Lynn and Vincent in particular were interested in lots of different fields, but, you know, particularly natural resource governance, governance of shared resources, uh, municipal governance, a lot of related issues around federalism and polycentricity. Um, these days, we're carrying on that torch with a number of working groups that if you're not already involved, I'd encourage you to join. Um, that includes a working group on polycentricity. The next meeting for that's coming up in the next kind of week and a half. We have those meetings monthly. Uh, there's a working group on property rights reform. Um, there's uh, working groups around uh, law and economics. There's going to be one on specific frameworks like governing knowledge commons. Um, uh, even, believe it or not, some coming up on space governance. Um, so we really encourage the formation and a kind of a bottom-up, more, much more organic exercise of all of these working groups, which can help, you know, tie together a lot of our existing programs. But the programs themselves, there's one on cybersecurity and internet governance that I run. Um, this basically takes a lot of the work that uh, Lynn and her many collaborators have done, um, like David Victor and Dan Cole and so many others, on polycentricity and regime complexes, such as in the climate change context, to figure out how we can do a better job at lots of governance levels to better manage global collective action problems like climate change. But here we're applying those ideas to another massive challenge, um, cybersecurity and internet governance, right? So under this program, we've had a number of events, uh, including two collaboratively with Australia National University over the past year on making democracy harder to hack, one in DC and then last one this past spring in Canberra. Uh, we've also had an inaugural colloquium where we explored lots of different facets in Bloomington. Um, we're having a cyber peace workshop unpacking, and I'll say more about this, what do we mean by cyber peace? Um, how can we learn from other analogies and contexts and apply these insights to creating a more sustainable uh, vision of cybersecurity uh, that, for example, protects human rights? We're doing that with NYU on November 22nd, uh, which is sandwiched between a few different UN meetings. So there'll be opportunities to beam into part of that discussion as well as to contribute live. So if you're interested and you'll be in New York, November 22nd, that's gonna be a lot of fun. And then we'll have a follow-up event this coming spring, uh, this coming April in Bloomington, uh, to really set out, lay out this uh, agenda uh, for, for cyber peace studies going forward. So that's some of what's going on in this. There's lots of other uh, aspects to this work around Internet of Things governance that I'll say a bit more about as we get to it, blockchain governance, you name it. Uh, but there's other programs as well, including one on data and information governance. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work done uh, there by my colleague, Professor Angie Raymond. And I'd encourage you guys to reach out if you're interested in a lot of issues, for example, around AI governance, um, the integrity of scientific information, uh, you name it. There's a lot of interesting work going on. Uh, there's also one on natural resource governance that Dean Luke um, heads up. Uh, and he does a lot of work, for example, with young scholars in particular. So if you fall into that category, that could be a great opportunity to get involved there. And then we have another program that's a bit of a mouthful called Paleo, which is political, economic, legal institutions and organizations. You know, more or less everything under the sun when you think about it. So that might, the name might be revised uh, in, in the not too distant future, but it looks at a lot of relate, uh, issues in political economy, including some specific uh, issues around ungoverned spaces and democratic sustainability. So those are just a few things that are going on. Uh, we just had our workshop on the workshop, which is held every five years in Bloomington over the summer.
there will be, we've decided, another kind of big event coming up before the next WOW in another five years. So we're shooting to have this next event um, kind of two or so years from now. And we're still toying with some different ideas, but it might be focused on global commons governance, kind of new commons, old commons stuff. So stay tuned for more information on that. A lot of interesting stuff happening though. So if you're not already um, on our mailing list, if you're not already an affiliate, I'd encourage you guys to become one so that you're aware of what's going on. We just launched a new podcast that, that uh, dropped, I think it was just yesterday, believe it or not, a new YouTube channel that takes care and keeps track of all of our events. Just for example, this evening, we have our Osher Memorial Lecture that will be happening with, uh, with Doc Searles, who's a privacy scholar uh, for decades now, is currently at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center. And um, there's a, all of these are either streamed live or archived later. So I encourage you to you know, check it out, get involved. And it's a wonderful community of now more than 600 affiliates to become a part of. So that's a little bit about the workshop. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll push forward. This is very brief. The other hat that I wear is chairing our cybersecurity program. Um, just like the workshop is a hub for multidisciplinary social science research, we try to approach issues around cybersecurity in the same way um, at IU. So this program that I chair brings together our business, law, and computer science schools under one common umbrella so that students learn about the technical, legal, and business aspects of cybersecurity. The most interesting thing to note for purposes of our talk, though, is um, we're launching a new cybersecurity clinic in the spring, which is going to be housed actually at the Ostrom Workshop, because the clinic is going to be focused on improving governance, particularly governance of local critical infrastructure. So look, working with local governments, um, small utilities, school corporations, to basically harden them against an array of different cyber threats like ransomware, but also to improve and have them think more about you know, data governance and how they can work better with state and federal partners around common issues. So you can see how the you know, OSHAMS frameworks kind of come into play there. Okay, so now on to the kind of the core piece uh, for my remaining time. And that's gonna be focused on a book that Charlie kindly mentioned is gonna be coming out uh, potentially before Christmas. I'm sure it'll be quite a stocking stuffer, so reserve your copy early. Uh, no, it, it, it's a bit of an academic tome, and I'll say more about it in just a moment, but this work um, started life as my doctoral dissertation in Cambridge way back in the day. I never turned it into a book, so this has been an interesting process to revisit that, update it, and uh, focus it much more heavily on cybersecurity and internet governance than it was originally, uh, because those are, as you know, pretty hot topics these days. Just to put this work in perspective though, the other um, research uh, kind of streams I have going on right now are particularly in the realm of the internet of things. Um, this idea that everything not connected to the internet, you know, from our clothes to even our bodies um, might soon be in the not too distant future. And the questions that really, you know, interest me is how can we improve governance? How can we respect you know, human rights and uh, personal integrity, privacy in such a hyper-connected world. Um, in other words, how can we, you know, leverage and, and realize the benefits um, that this massively distributed network uh, provides to us while also not falling victim to all the related costs. So this is a book that's as part of Oxford Press's What Everyone Needs to Know series. It's a question and answer format that's supposed to be uh, much more ideally accessible and frankly, hopefully a lot of fun to read. Um, so that'll be coming out in the spring too. So if there's IoT related questions, we can get into that. And then we have a lot of kind of sector specific work that's going on, um, as well as related areas. So I'm doing projects now, as you see on the screen, um, with a lot of uh, specific um, uh, issues around, you know, from uh, industrial policy and smart factories uh, to sports, um, to now I'm, we're doing new projects on governing AI. Um, comparing EU and US approaches to managing privacy. Uh, we're doing some interesting work on smart kind of slash safe cities. We just had a conference with Virginia Tech this last week on, uh, on kind of smart cities. This is a lot of work that builds directly from the governing knowledge commons framework. For example, that you know Mike Madison and Brett Frischman and Kathy and so many others have worked on. Um, so you can kind of start to see how a lot of these are kind of meshed together. So, you know, I try to do, in other words, some high level stuff, like we'll talk about with this book, but also try to dig down in the weeds a bit, um, including with some surveys that I can talk more about that we're finishing up and we'll be going out um, in the not too distant future as well. So this book in particular, um, Governing New Frontiers in the Information Age. Um, as I said, it started life as my doctoral dissertation. 
which means, let's face it, uh, definitely an academic tome, uh, you know, not written in the most accessible format. So I've tried to change that. Uh, the book uh, originally was geared for discerning lessons from um, sustainable development and learning how sustainable development is transitioning throughout a variety of different frontiers, right? So these include kind of the traditional global commons. So there's, for example, chapters on uh, atmospheric governance and climate change, on uh, the deep seabed and the high seas and on Antarctica and space, right? But, you know, the focus throughout is not only describing how and why governance of these regimes is transitioning from, in these cases, uh, much more kind of top-down multilateral systems to ones that we could describe as being much more polycentric. And there's a spectrum here with climate kind of in one end and space a bit on the other. But we see a whole array of, for example, polycentric clubs, um, you know, small groups of countries, regions coming together to manage these big, complex, global collective action challenges, as well as some other interesting uh, asides about how power is being redistributed, not only toward a more multipolar system, but even a nonpolar system with a lot more, for example, private actors um, gaining power. And as a result, we need to think through governance models and mechanisms for how to leverage that so that we can better manage these issues that we're all facing, whether it's, you know, oceanic pollution or climate change or cyber attacks, right? Um, so that's what this book tries to do. Again, that's very ambitious, but I try to glean lessons uh, from each of these different contexts and the kind of the classic global commons, apply them to internet governance and cybersecurity, and also talk about vice versa, how cyberspace is impacting the governance of these other uh, frontiers, right? Um, whether that's thinking about how submarine cables and uh, the laying thereof are impacting the governance of the seas um, to thinking about space, right? And the way we regulated that, which traditionally was much more focused on, you know, not having uh, weapons of mass destruction, basically nuclear weapons in orbit, not so much on how do we deal with, you know, cyber attacks and the problems of orbital debris um, that can get out of hand pretty quickly in a future conflict. So that's a little bit about the book. Um, as I said, it'll be uh, hopefully coming out uh, either December, January, as soon as I get the page proofs done. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about each of the chapters as we uh, go through here. And then I welcome your questions as well. But just really briefly, I thought, you know, since maybe not all of us are um, uh, as familiar perhaps with, you know, a bit of the history of cybersecurity and a bit of the history of internet governance, I thought I would say just a bit about that before really diving in to talk more about, you know, governance and kind of lessons learned at a higher level. So, you know, in the book and in related work, I've tried to, uh, you know, build from the work of lots of folks, lots of giants in this field to, to you know, get an understanding for how we got to where we are. Um, and then, you know, the crystal ball can be very opaque, but kind of project out current trend lines, right? With the idea of being, of exploring how we can bend that curve, as, uh, you know, MLK famously said, toward, you know, perhaps some vision of cyber peace, which we'll talk more about. Just in brief, though, you know, this is not a new problem. Cyber attacks, they've been around for decades now. There's different ideas about when the first ones happened. Some point to episodes in the 60s um, or even the 70s, which was used to misdirect railroad cars in the late 70s. But, you know, a lot of history start on November 2nd, 1988. Um, that's when a Cornell grad student infected MIT's network with one of the first cyber attacks. Um, basically, it's called a logic bomb, which resulted in kind of a massive, you can think about it as a flood attack. So attacks of way, way too many requests for information, which caused the then pretty still nascent internet to, you know, more or less crash. Um, this uh, led to a world of trouble for Roger, this grad student. He was prosecuted under the then pretty recent Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was passed in the late 80s. But don't feel too sorry for him. Um, he's now a professor at MIT, as well as a dot-com millionaire. So, you know, things didn't work out too poorly for the world's first cyber attacker. Uh, what's different these days, of course, is how quickly these attacks are proliferating in numbers, sophistication, and severity, and the fact that they're targeting companies and countries alike at unheard of levels, which is why I argue, you know, they've become a global collective action problem. And, you know, potentially they could even be a symptom of a wider market failure when it comes to cybersecurity and data governance that, you know, might be a bit provocative, but we can talk about what the implications of that, you know, might be. In the book, I try to analyze cyberspace here at a lot of levels. So we talk about it as, you know, on the one hand, you could think about it as a collection of private goods, right? 
which is fair enough. Um, but you know, depending on the level of what you're interested in, if you kind of get beyond this IO, Internet of Things or IoT mindset, you know, it could also be an interesting uh, problem of a club good, right? With these small communities, networks, coalitions of companies coming together. Um, and even at the highest level up, there's still questions of, you know, is it a knowledge commons? Is it a pseudo or imperfect commons that we'll talk more about? But I just wanted to plant that seed now to get you thinking about kind of where we're headed. So these problems are only getting more acute, though, with this expanding internet of everything, you could argue. Um, and there's widely varying estimates, but we're looking at a future in which billions of devices, um, from our you know, toasters, to our smartphones, to our refrigerators, to believe it or not, we went mattress shopping, my wife and I, last week, and even our beds uh, will be connected you know, to the internet, right? So there is this hyper-connected future in which we're hurtling toward I think it's a legitimate question, though, of whether it's going to be an internet of everything or not, because there's related trends that are kind of pushing back against this conceptualization. For example, you might have been hearing about disputes about, you know, Huawei and the rollout of 5G, which is going to power this internet of everything idea. Um, and basically, there's different architectural models that are being put forward, and countries are choosing which of those to take on and build upon. Right now, more than 65 countries, for example, are using Huawei architecture, which doesn't play well uh, with others. So in other words, the decisions we're making today about how we're building out this infrastructure will impact this you know, hyper-connected future and whether or not it is kind of a global network commons or whether there's a new digital divide that's forming right before our eyes, which gets us thinking about different implications of that, collective action problems that stem from it, of course, um, as well as other related challenges, uh, and which is, I think, where the Oysterms come in, with some interesting insights about how to manage those effectively, which we'll, we'll talk more about. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, too. So that's a little bit of background on, you know, the cybersecurity dilemma. Um, now let's look at a few lessons and how the book kind of structures this approach. Um, so, you know, I, I don't offer, for example, here's the definitive guide or here's, you know, a, a governing global commons framework. What I try to do is supplement what's out there already. So I take as a starting point the ocean design principles and the IAD SES frameworks and some insights from the governing knowledge commons and try to apply those here um, to cyberspace, of course, but also to think about to help us at least consider um, the current governance status and, uh, and looking ahead to where we might be headed in each of these regions that you see on the screen. Now, there's different schools of thought on to what extent each of these are traditional kind of global common spaces um, because of, you know, for example, the degree to which national appropriation is happening in each of these spaces driven by advancing technology that we'll say more about too. Um, so, you know, we see this playing out, for example, in the, in the high seas. Um, the, high, the, the, the line between what constituted a territorial sea and a high sea was historically drawn in relation to technology, right? How far could you shoot a cannon? How far out could you protect your, your uh, property rights? As the technology improved, that line got pushed further and further out. And now with this modern push, you know, for resources found in continental shelves, uh, both living and mineral resources. Um, there is a lot of pressure that's being put on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to extend out this idea of appropriation. Um, when, you, when you overlay that with the drive to lay more and more you know, submarine cables to kind of power this internet of everything, there's interesting questions that come up about, you know, frankly, the nationalization of the high seas um, and the commercialization thereof. There are organizations in place kind of pushing back against that trend. So, for example, in the high seas, you have what we could argue is the most realized vision of, you know, managing the global commons uh, in relation to this kind of old concept of the common heritage of mankind idea, uh, which basically purports to help ensure the equitable, sustainable, use of global common pool resources like the deep seabed. Um, there's different iterations of it. For example, it's the common concern of mankind um, in the atmospheric context and the biological context. It's not even mentioned in the Antarctic Treaty, which was the first arms control treaty of the Cold War, but it is mentioned 
in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for the deep seabed, which is why we have the International Seabed Authority based in Jamaica, um, as well as in space, which I'll talk more about in just a second. As far as some of the lessons learned, you know, in the book, I try to look at the high seas and I pay particular attention to the International Seabed Authority, as well as the different codes of conduct and regulations to sustainably manage these resources that it spawned to try to think through, all right, how would something like this look as applied to cyberspace? Similarly, and here's a great case in point, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, you know, took decades to negotiate in its final form. It wasn't finalized until the mid 90s in 94. And there, you know, it only passed the finishing line because it recognized the vital role that companies, frankly, the private sector should play in exploiting some of these resources. So the way the ISA is set up, basically we have companies exploring and we have, uh, you know, for example, uh, resources in the deep sea bed. Then we have them partnering with countries with the revenue that's generated being shared by, you know, the coastal country as well as landlocked um, developing countries, which is kind of an interesting model to think through this shared global common pool resource. It kind of gets me thinking back to some of Vincent, you know, Ostrom's early work in helping to draft the Constitution of Alaska and how they thought about, you know, divvying up the resources to the citizenry that live there, right? And these days, there's interesting work being done um, that, that I'm keen on, at least, on how we can better, you know, uh, award people for sharing their data, basically paying you, right, for all the data that we're now currently giving away. So I think there might be some insights there that we can think through when it comes to sustainably managing these different natural and, art and artificial resources. Um, for Antarctica, you know, this was, as I said, uh, one of the oldest treaties in the, in the list here, uh, the first armed control treaty, also the only continent governed by a treaty. Um, it's interesting because it takes this idea of the common heritage of mankind idea, which calls for peaceful use to an extreme. It bars any type of military operations in Antarctica. Uh, science really became the currency of diplomacy down at the South Pole. And, you know, it's interesting because it's done a pretty decent job, despite a lot of pressure at keeping the peace down there. Um, as applied to Internet governance, I find it interesting, at least, because it has some lessons for, you know, how to sustainably manage problems, maybe not even coming to a resolution, but agreeing to disagree for some period of time. And the case of the Antarctic Treaty for decades has had some peaceful and positive impacts, you could argue. But his lessons are limited to, um, you know, for example, unfortunately, in the cyber context, the cat's already out of the bag. We're not going to end, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the use of cyberspace to, you know, be able to launch cyber attacks. That would basically require a re-engineering of the Internet itself to provide for increased, um, you know, attribution which would thereby you know, decrease anonymity, which would have other considerations. So even if you could do it, there's still questions of whether we'd want to do it or not. So this analogy only takes us so far, too. In the space and atmospheric you know, context, um, and as, we, as we said, weapons are regulated in space, but really only the worst case. Um, these weapons of mass destruction, cyber attacks, of course, aren't mentioned in this golden age of space law which went from the uh, negotiation and signing of the Outer Space Treaty in the late 60s to the failure of the Moon Treaty in the early 80s, in part because of pushback against this common heritage of mankind idea that we can talk more about during discussion if folks are interested. But you know, these lessons and in the atmospheric context in particular, um, I see a lot of parallels um, with internet governance debates happening now, particularly when it comes to climate change and atmospheric governance. David Victor, for example, did a really nice job, I thought, of writing up some thoughts about why the Paris Accord um, has been as successful as it has. Clearly, far from perfect, much more needs to be done, but it did provide a framework, uh, which you could argue is very polycentric in its conceptualization, basically with um, various governance units at various scales from cities on up to states on up to regions. I'm talking about what we're going to do uh, to meet these goals that we've set out, right? So it's kind of a bottom-up response to this global challenge. There's problems with enforcement and verification, of course, of those goals, and they clearly need to be, need to be made more ambitious. But, you know, I do some writing in that chapter about, hey, maybe we could do something similar in the cyber context with countries 
you know, naming what they're going to do, for example, to better protect civilian critical infrastructure or human rights, um, and then naming and shaming if they don't go along um, with those goals. There's other issues that we need to address too, such as better transparency for what's happening. Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of countries don't like to be very forthcoming in the aftermath of cyber attacks. So there's other issues to get at there, but there, I think there's some interesting lessons to think about as well. So just to get us thinking um, about how each of these frontiers is being challenged, if not shrinking outright, here's a map of the world uh, from a UK Ministry of Defense think tank that overlays that 200 mile exclusive economic zone onto the global oceans. And as you see, you know, what we think of as the traditional, you know, of high seas shrinks pretty quick, right? When we think about it in those terms. Similarly, at, in the Arctic, all but a hundred square miles of the, um, of the Arctic uh, Ocean have been claimed by one or more of the Arctic states. Uh, now, what's interesting is that so far, this has been done pretty peacefully. Um, and relatively sustainably, in part because of the uh, work done by the Arctic Council, this polycentric club up there of Arctic states, plus some observers like the EU, China, plenty of others, that you know, have, have worked to go after low-hanging fruits. In other words, they didn't start with territorial disputes. This group started with, hey, let's provide for a search and rescue. Okay, we can all agree we need that. Okay, let's try to come up with some, um, some rules for sustainable development in this space between this club, right? And in part because of those open lines of communication, which was really a vital part of the ocean design principles and navigating kind of the classic tragedy of the common scenarios, I'd argue at least that the international community or this subset thereof has done a decent job at least of so far managing these challenges. Now there's plenty of evidence um, that these challenges are mounting. There's deepening divides, uh, particularly between you know, Canada, Russia, um, and the US hasn't even signed or ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So there's issues there as well uh, that we can talk more about if folks are curious. Just as a side note, uh, one reason I'd argue that tensions are so high, especially in the South China Sea, is that there is no similar regional forum there. There is no polycentric club to boost um, and provide a channel for communication, even if it's pretty basic communication among all the players, right? You know, so one could argue maybe that'd be one way to decrease tensions, of course, easier said than done, um, but we've seen the benefits of it at the high north. So that gets us thinking even more about cyberspace in this context. Um, again, just in the interest of time, I'll keep plowing forward here. So yeah, forgive me for being pretty, pretty quick, you know, but cyberspace um, is not that old of a concept, right? This is a concept that really came to light um, in the 80s, right? There were terms before that, like cybernetics, of course, back in the 40s, but cyberspace itself was a term developed by a sci-fi author, William Gibson, in a book called Neuromancer, right? He talked about cyberspace as a shared hallucination, which I thought was pretty perfect. Uh, and maybe pretty accurate for how a lot of us, you know, uh, uh, interact with cyberspace today. But just in brief, there's not a lot of agreement about if cyberspace is a global collective, uh, a global network commons, excuse me, to use um, Hillary Clinton's phrase, that in which, you know, for example, certain freedoms, think of FDR's four freedoms should apply to. If it's just an extension of national territory, the way that plenty of international lawyers and policymakers would like us to view it, Think of the cyber sovereignty idea, or you know maybe it's somewhere in the middle, an imperfect or a pseudo commons to use, um, for example, Professor Nye's uh, phrase there. So you have to uh, realize that you know how we think about it and um, who should have a say in managing it goes directly kind of hand in hand with you know what should happen and 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 uh, you know how we come to a resolution of some of these key challenges like cyber attacks. In brief, how we've managed the internet has changed dramatically, you know, over the years. In the 70s and 80s, it should not come as a huge shock that nobody really cared all that much. Uh, back then, the internet was managed by grad students, in some cases with fantastic beards, who were all waiting for somebody with a tie, you know, to show up and tell them how this thing should work. Nobody really did um, until the late 90s, right? And by that point, you know, the commercial uh, benefits of the internet, even the national security implications, uh, started to become better understood 
So in 98, the Clinton administration decides, you know what, we're going to establish this organization called ICANN, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is a private nonprofit corporation um, in Southern California that until 2016 was under contract from the Department of Commerce to manage the global uh, top level domain system. So in other words, they get to decide who gets to be, for example, a country in cyberspace, this nonprofit in California. So as a question of governance, you can think pretty quickly of why countries around the world might chafe at that um, a little bit, especially as you know, the number of citizens, the number of folks around the world started to increase so dramatically post 2000. So there have been some nods over the years to globalize this structure. ICANN is now independent since 2016. We now have the Internet Governance Forum set up, which is kind of a high level talking shop with that of a lot of authority. And there's plenty of ideas out there to reform this, to make it a more inclusive system. But as we said, at the same time, there's deepening digital divides about how we think of this space. Should it be a global network commons in which internet freedom um, should prevail? Or should it be a collection of basically digital walled gardens where each country gets to decide for itself how it should be managed? What you see up there is a map of the world. Basically, the countries in black are those that at least 20, in 2012, favored this more state-centric vision of cyberspace. Um, those countries in red prefer this more multi-stakeholder internet freedom vision of cyberspace. The world is not this black and white. Uh, there's plenty of shades of gray in between, especially these days. But what's causing countries to kind of not, not really, not necessarily choose sides, but starting to is this debate about 5G and what architecture do you want to use? Because um, pretty quickly that goes hand in hand with you know, bigger decisions around internet governance and the role of the state, right? So in other words, there'd be a lot of overlap between the countries in black up here and uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, to put it frankly. So Joe Nye, Professor Nye put together this chart showing all of this alphabet soup of organizations, a classic polycentric um, regime complex uh, that, uh, that shows you, uh, you know, how the internet is governed, it's messy, um, uh, there's some organizations that are a bit top down historically, like ICANN, a lot of others, like the Internet Engineering Task Force, that are totally organic, very bottom up, grassroots driven. And there's lots of others in between. There's a whole ecosystem of nonprofits and civil society in the mix, too, with a lot of un unresolved questions, including cyber peace, which is why we're hosting that cyber peace workshop coming up. Again, just in the interest of time, we are looking at lots of different analogies to better understand these challenges, including sustainable development. So I spend some significant time in the book talking about lessons from the green movement, um, sustainable cybersecurity. Uh, I wrote a whole article about that a couple years ago, and I try to build from that a bit in this book, um, uh, as well as looking at lessons from corporate social responsibility. There's lots of different you know, frameworks and tools that were developed by the green movement around certification schemes, sustainability reporting, um, even lessons from environmental law, like common but differentiated responsibilities that I think resonate pretty well, actually, in the, um, in the internet governance context. And you know, then at the end, since we're talking about reforming um, uh, you know, property rights, thinking about how uh, all of us, frankly, can benefit from the amazing uh, and extraordinarily deep resources that we still have around the world, both real and digital. I do a little bit with blockchain in the book, too. Um, you know, this is this idea of a global distributed ledger of who owns what. It's not a panacea. It has plenty of problems. Um, it can, for example, fall victim to cyber attacks. Don't let anybody tell you that it can't. You know, Bitcoin is a well-known application of this technology, but the broader idea is this concept of smart contracts, right? How can you, you know, use the power of this technology to make an immutable ledger of who owns what, right? You could do that, for example, for the deep sea bed. You can even do that for asteroids if you really wanted to and kind of parcel out the benefits via kind of either in a currency context, so direct kind of crypto payments, or just as Greece and lots of countries are doing, putting their property deeds in this format. So it's clear about you know, who owns what, which can contribute to better governance as well. There's been proposals for everything from a you know, climate uh, coin or a climate token to, um, I do some stuff with that on, uh, on dealing with various uh, issues, for example, around climate change and oceanic pollution. Lots of different notions. So far, very few are at anything but a conceptual stage. 
but you know there's some potential there that I argue is worth exploring further. And that, of course, brings us then as we wrap up here uh, to how all this comes together in this idea of cyber peace, right? So I got interested in this back, uh, as Charlie mentioned, in my 2014 book. And there's been lots of efforts over the years to you know, define this. Um, this is one that I had first come across back then. Uh, that Believe it or not, the Vatican and the World Federation of Scientists put together. Uh, they basically liken cyber peace to a universal order of cyberspace built on a wholesale state of tranquility, which sounds fantastic, right? I mean, who would want that? But if you look at the list up here, basically it's arguing for, you know, the end of cyber attacks, a negative cyber piece, um, which would be lovely, just not all that likely. So I'm interested in particular on how we can think about a more positive vision um, of this that frankly respects human rights, um, spreads internet access along with cybersecurity best practices, and strengthens these polycentric, uh, multi-stakeholder governance mechanisms by taking a networked and distributed approach to this very networked and distributed problem, right? Use a phrase by Robert Naki there. So that's some of the work that we're doing um, in the context of cyber peace. Uh, that's gonna be the focus, for example, of this cyber peace workshop at NYU on November 22nd and our follow-up event uh, this next April in Bloomington. So. My apologies again for going through a lot of that, you know, pretty quickly, uh, but it's been just such a pleasure uh, having this opportunity today, Charlie. And I wonder if, you know, if you or if any other folks on the line might have any questions or comments before we close. Scott, uh, thank you so much that you went through a great deal in just the right amount of time. Um, I'm gonna turn it immediately over to the attendees. Again, uh, I think at least one or more people join may not have heard me, you can answer, ask a question using the Q&A um, mm -hmm. option at the bottom of your screen or somewhere on your screen, there should be a, a Q&A mm -hmm. or you can send a chat message mm -hmm. if you can't find the Q&A mm -hmm. uh, or you can raise your hand um, if yeah. that's the only way you can figure this out. So mm -hmm. um, we're uh, looking, we're monitoring that to see if there are any questions. Um, Scott, while while we're waiting for mm -hmm. people to type in, um, mm -hmm. I had a question about the role of open standards. Yeah. In all of this, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you'd mentioned you know the kind of this new digital divide at one point in the talk, mm -hmm. and the and the cyber regime map that you've got up there mm -hmm. with all these different organizations. Mm -hmm. um, can you reflect a little bit about? Uh, you know, the, the governance of open standards or the importance of open standards and what you're thinking mm -hmm. about. You're right, and, you, and you're right to point to that. That is kind of a central consideration here. Um, so, you know, particularly in the internet governance context, there are a couple of groups that have been really influential um, for thinking and, and working on these issues for really decades now. And, you know, one I would point to is one I just mentioned in passing during the talk, but it's really important. It's one that very few people have heard of. And it's called the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. And you know, um, they're responsible for making it so that we can all communicate via very different you know, computers and networks all around the world. Uh, um, so this is the group that kind of took up the baton, for example, to improve um, and build upon uh, TCP IP, which is the Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, right? And this is the thing that was unveiled in the early 80s that really has made the internet, you know, the internet rather than a series of separate, you know, national intranets. Um, unlike ICANN, which, as we said, was kind of a U.S. government creation, a bit top down, IETF, super grassroots, very bottom up. Um, and they're very active um, today, even though like the first generation, wonderful folks like Scott Bradner uh, are retiring, right? What's interesting is that instead of, to oversimplify, just kind of a lot of technically minded folks who just want to contribute to the community and, and do good, find answers. Um, and interestingly enough, as, as a quick aside, the way that these protocols are, uh, are, are produced um, and these answers are found, it's not because, you know, the group, for example, votes and there's, you know, more than 50% yes, and then it's mandated on the community, you know, far from it. Famously, this group runs by rough consensus and running code, right? So pretty much it's just consensus-based. Um, nobody's telling anybody that we got to use these protocols. 
Uh, we do it because they work. Interestingly though, these days, the process is becoming a little bit more, um, I don't wanna go so far as to say politicized, but we do see a lot of big companies sending pretty sizable delegations to IETF uh, meetings, as well as governments like China, right? Uh, and, and among many others. So in other words, I think it's being better understood that these protocols that these standards really matter. And that if you can write these protocols and standards in such a way that they benefit um, your industry or your preferred you know, ch national champion, if you want but to find a point on it, that can have a huge impact uh, uh, on how these things are rolled out and the economic opportunities that are associated with it. So I, I think you're right to, to point to that as an interesting case study in, uh, in governance that for really decades has worked actually pretty well in a very, you know, Bloomington school sense of it, right? Um, a kind of self-governance writ large at the global level. And it's really interesting now to see, you know, how that is, is starting to be challenged a bit by these nations and these big companies kind of entering the fray. Um, so uh, one actually piece that we have coming out in the spring is, is looking at the IETF with one of its original architects, Scott Bradner, to see, you know, what, what it portends and how it can better manage, you know, for example, this Internet of Things wave that's coming up. So I, I think you're absolutely right to point to that as a key kind of area of, of concern worthy of further study. Uh, yeah, and the one thing that comes to mind to me, uh, there's a group I've been working with that's uh, it's called FIDO, which mm -hmm. is around the strong authentication um, related work or the biophysical kind of authentication yeah. and how that plays out when you get to uh, internet of everything where your, mm -hmm. your bed is, <laughs> I, I have no idea how, it, it seems like it's gonna get much more complex. But yeah. um, Scott, I don't know if you can see the Q&A. Uh, there's a question yeah. um, on the Q&A. Do you want to address that? Yeah, yeah. Michael was asking about, you know, uh, what are the relevant nested systems for global cybersecurity? Great question. And we think about, you know, nested here in the kind of the Ostrom design principle sense. Uh, that sense, of course, been expanded through lots of other related frameworks. So. There, there, there's quite a few, which is, you know, a benefit and a drawback of our current approach. Um, we have coalitions, uh, both on the civil society side, led by some well-known nonprofits like Consumer Reports, frankly, and their digital standard, um, uh, and two new NGOs that have been stood up. For example, there was a new Cyber Peace Institute that was announced just a few weeks ago now. Um, I use actually a part of that effort. And there's uh, lots of other companies involved in that, lots of other institutions of higher ed. So there's coalitions on the civil society, kind of private sector and academia, um, as well as groups of countries, right? So, you know, there, there's been some attempts at agreement with the G2, the US and China. So they came to an agreement back in 2015 to basically decrease incidents of trade secrets theft. Different schools have thought on how well that worked. It seems to have at least better manage this common challenge for a few years until, of course, more recent um, trade conflicts and other issues have entered the equation. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, frameworks put out and lists of norms by the G7 and the G20. Uh, the Carnegie Endowment actually has a wonderful database called, I think it's the International Cybersecurity Norms Index, where you can actually look at all these different documents and find areas of convergence and divergence between them. But they're on it. Um, there's also a UN group of government experts that's been working through various iterations for more than a decade now. There's a meeting coming up in New York later this year where, among other things, those members are going to be talking about how international law should apply to cyber attacks. There's been efforts to figure this out through some books like the Talon Manual, but this will be countries going on the record, which has a lot of interesting implications as well. Um, and then there's other related efforts like the Global Commission on Cyber Stability. There's different foundations involved. Like I was at a, at a conference this last week that the uh, Cyber Future Foundation uh, put on. There's a whole ecosystem, in other words, of um, different nested structures that are involved in this. And one thing that I'd like to do is you see the cyber regime complex up here. I'm trying to work on one that's cybersecurity specific, uh, which is easier said than done. But, but the idea is let's show a little bit more transparently what the inner interrelationships are between all these different groups and kind of what they're after. And the idea then is um, to shine a light on any governance gaps and also 
help to you know crystallize next steps for how we can fill them. So that was a great so, question, Michael. Scott, yeah, sure. there's a, another question that says, uh, re it's really interesting to look at these other frontiers and their mm -hmm. governance to think about how to govern cyberspace. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've, you've talked about that in, in your slides, but can you expand or give uh, you know, another example of how these other frontiers have informed your thinking? Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, so it's, but I'm happy to give at least a few, you know, a few examples. Uh, you know, in, in some ways they're cautionary tales, and in other ways, you know, they're they're models of international collaboration, right? So, you know, for example, the fact that we could go, you know, from Sputnik to an agreed upon global multilateral framework for uh, managing, you know, the challenge of space governance in a decade is kind of amazing, really, right? And partly that was due to the alignment of uh, the Cold War, right? There were basically two sides, and when those sides agree, progress was pretty quick. Um, uh, in that case, the, that started to fall apart in the 80s, and with the end of the Cold War, it fell apart that much more quickly. So there's lots of charts and work as part of uh, regime effectiveness efforts that I included to look at, you know, each of these regimes you know, to see how they rose and fell and rose again in some cases, you know, over the years. Um, in the deep seabed context, you know, it's interesting because unlike space, which had, you know, about a 15 year really good run when it comes to multilateral uh, treaty making and still the UN uh, Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is, is, uh, is pretty active. Um, the seas was basically custom, right? <clears throat> and it's a case study that shows how long it could take sometimes for norms to crystallize in a custom to finally get codified into a treaty, right? I mean, in, depending how you measure it, that took centuries. It took at least 50 years in a post-World War II to get that done. And, you know, I, I talk about this in the book, but one reason I think we're seeing such a pullback in, uh, or at least, you know, tensions with classic multilateral treaty making to deal with these challenges is because of geopolitics getting a lot more complicated, scarcity increasing, right? Technology advancing, uh, which is all part of the evaluation criteria that I, that I try to supplement, um, uh, building from those frameworks that we already talked about, right? Like the IAD and SES frameworks. Um, so, you know, what interests me then is what do we do from here? I think if you graphed all these different, you know, frontiers out on a spectrum of kind of from, you know, almost, not monocentric, but at least multilateral, all the way to kind of fully polycentric. You know, they 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 would they would run the gambit, right? So you know, uh, the atmosphere, cyberspace would be much more toward the polycentric end of the spectrum, uh, with Antarctica arguably being on the other extreme. The high sea is not too far behind, and the uh, outer space kind of somewhere in the middle there these days, especially with the rise of lots of different regional clubs. The EU, uh, Luxembourg in particular, has been really active. There's been lots of codes of conduct that Australia and others have put out there to get a better handle on, for example, the problem of space debris. So I think it's a really rich environment um, that had a wave of interest in the 80s up to the late 90s. You know, you saw lots of books like Susan Buck and lots of others um, who wrote about kind of governing global common stuff. Uh, but then it really fell by the wayside, at least as far as I could tell in the literature, for about 15 years. And I think we're seeing a really good and uh, well-timed resurgence of interest that coincides, frankly, with a growing realization of the problems we're facing uh, from the climate crisis to the cyber crisis um, to all the other related environmental and security challenges that really pervade this. So, you know, I try to make the case in the book that these issues that were really at the frontiers of international relations and law are increasingly at the core, right? So we got to pay more attention to them. We got to look back to see, you know, what's worked over this last 50 plus years, um, not only apply it to cyber so that we avoid, um, you know, uh, repeating mistakes, uh, but also so that we can benefit, you know, all these other related regimes and, and contribute to good governance in the process. Well, fantastic, Scott. Um, very nicely said. Um, let me just, uh, we're about about out of time. Uh, any last questions from the attendees through the Q&A or through the chat? Uh, 
Okay. I really enjoyed this. So thank you yeah. so much, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's really a, a pleasure, um, Scott, and I'm going to run out and order the book. Oh, yeah. um, so let me just close uh, in the couple minutes we have left uh, this, this uh, North America IASC regional keynote address with a few uh, final points. Mm -hmm. um, on behalf of IASC and all of the World Commons Week organizers, I'd really like to thank the attendees for taking their time and attention today and especially to Scott for preparing and giving this really interesting keynote address. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no real way to clap, but feel free to raise your hand um, to acknowledge Scott with a high five if you can find that function. Um, okay, there we go. at least some people have. Um, so uh, this was uh, the fourth actually of uh, six regional and, or continental keynote, World Commons Week keynote webinars. We've already had one for Europe, Africa, China, and now this was the North American one. Mm -hmm. um, what, what Scott's uh, displaying now is we have Asia one in about 11 hours. I'll be doing this again um, for Asia. And then on the next slide, we also have uh, Latin America on no October 11th. Uh, mm -hmm. So a little different topics, but um, as I said, we're trying to create a global uh, dialogue reduce our carbon footprint a bit and uh, highlight the activities of the different IASC regions. Um, I'd like to also, next slide, Scott, if you don't mind. Um, we're also, right now, uh, if you haven't paid attention to World Commons Week, we've got um, 55 different local uh, participants doing local activities around the world. That's up from, last year was our first time doing this. We had 31 last year, we're up to 55. I'm hoping this might double next year. Um, mm -hmm. Again, kind of spreading the word around commons research and practice in lots of different areas. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about to end, but I, I'd like to point out that the IASC at uh, uh, University or Arizona State University are doing their third IASC workshop in March, mm -hmm. uh, working together workshop, so that um, you, people can uh, um, find that. Uh, I don't know if you can see the website here, but um, go to the IAC page. Mm -hmm. And then to, to close, um, I just, I, I had to add this. Um, uh, Esther Mwangwe is a common scholar, a colleague, a friend. She was just elected to the IAC Executive Council, mm -hmm. um, uh, starting her tenure with that this year. And she passed away on the weekend. She, um, and I just had to, uh, recognize that and um, send her, our thoughts to her family. And uh, so we're dedicating this in her honor. Um, to close, uh, next slide, Scott. Um, on behalf of the IASC and the World Commons Week organizing team, thank you for attending. Uh, if you're not an IASC member, consider joining the IASC. Mm -hmm. um, at, the, at the location on your screen. And again, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, and I know you started with uh, some really terrific events going on at the Ostrom Workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to try to follow up on that and join some of that. Um, so thank, thank you, you, everyone, again. Um, thanks, Scott, for the time. Um, have a good rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in. Cheers. Thank you so much.